Hey everyone, welcome back to the Real Estate 101 podcast. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard, and with me today, I have Christian Ross. Christian, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Give us a quick rundown on your background and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, so I've been in real estate for 16 years. I'm also a real estate investor. Um, So I've been able to achieve financial independence, but I've also lost a lot of money. So I've learned a lot of lessons. Um, and I'm also a real estate broker. So I'm managing broker at Ingle Brokers Atlanta, also specialize in international real estate and am running a trip to the Dominican Republic uh, in a few weeks and uh, just love all things real estate. Yeah. That international component is what I found most interesting uh, that you're doing and you're doing it with your clients. And so I want I want to chat a bit about that. I know you can't buy or sell real estate even in different states in the US, unless you're also licensed in those states. So what is the licensing process for someone like you who helps clients buy and sell real estate domestically and internationally? Is there a specific license for each country? Is there something that's more uniform? So it really varies by country. A lot of times I work with a partner agent in that country. And I also have a business license in two countries. Um, So like the Dominican Republic just requires a business license. So not an actual real estate license. They actually do not have a MLS system. So you just can't go on and Google Dominican MLS and find homes in one uniform place. As I was doing research before our call, I saw that you have a program called the Fly and Buy program. And that really interested me. My guess is you're probably not the only one doing this, but it's the first time that I had personally come across it. So I found it interesting. Explain to us what this program is and how it works. Yeah. So basically you get your airline ticket. We take care of everything. It is a concierge approach to looking at real estate. So you fly down, we come, we have a set schedule for you. You'll look at development properties. You'll look at resale, depending on the country that we're at. And then if you decide to buy, especially if it's a developer property, you will get reimbursed usually up to $2,000. And that's still dependent on the state that you're from because there are just regulations regarding that. Um, But really, we just want you to have an opportunity to look at real estate, understand the financial investment, understand the legal component to it what the ROI is, and just in a non-pressure environment where you can just come look and still have a little fun. Like we're going to have a catamaran type of tour. Like it's, it's going to be great for you to understand the culture as well as the real estate. Through this program, where are you seeing most people buy? Is it pretty spread out or is there a common country or area where most people are buying? People love Mexico. They love, <laughs> they love Mexico. And um, I personally, I love Mexico. I just got back from Mexico City, which was my first time. And I'm in love and on Delta every day looking at flights back. Um, but I know for me, vacation wise, I don't want a city home. I want, I want to see ocean. I want to be able to walk to a beach. So, um, you know, a lot of people love Mexico. I think for Canadians, they love the Dominican Republic. They like Mexico too. And then Costa Rica is a big one. Um, Costa Rica is just blowing up and they have exceptional health care. John Hopkins actually has a kind of like a sister hospital in Costa Rica. So when people are looking at medical tourism, a lot of places that they're looking at for medical tourism also kind of coincide where they're looking at for real estate too. What is the most common reason for people buying internationally? Are most people buying it as a vacation home or are they doing it as an investment? So most times it's, it's a mix of both it's vacation and it's investment. And then I would say probably 25% of the time, some, someone in their family has an attachment to that particular place. So maybe they went to summers there or their grandmother was from that place. And they're, they're just trying to have um, that connection with that place. But a lot of times it is vacation slash investment with the focus on investment. How does the financing of international properties work? So a lot of times it's cash. However, there are a lot of loan programs out there where if you're putting 25 to 30% down, you can easily get a loan. Um, The biggest thing I always tell people just to be aware of is what is your exit strategy? Are you really trying to buy, hold, and enjoy? Are you looking at it as a flip? International real estate is not where you want to flip. (laughs) It's just not where you want to flip. You want to hold it, you want to enjoy it, and you want to get the cash flow. 
Are the loans with U.S. based banks or are they international banks wherever you're buying the property? It's a mix. So there are private money lenders and those private money lenders are based here in the U.S. And then there's Scotiabank. Scotiabank does a lot. Um, and they handle Mexico, a lot in the Caribbean. I'm not sure if they go as far as Costa Rica, but they definitely handle a lot in the Caribbean. And, um, but it's, you're mostly going to go through a private money lender or you're going to do a home equity on a property that you already um, own. And then sometimes there's owner financing. If you make a big enough down payment, there's a lot of owner financing. So where that's not as common in the US, it's definitely common abroad. Is it more, it's a lot more common there than it is here? Yeah, it's definitely more common where you can put down maybe 30% just like you would a bank and just make your payments. I'm but it sure. It won't be a 30 year term. <laughs> right. It won't be a 30 what do the terms usually look like? Is there a standard for owner financing? Um, not really a standard, but I would say kind of like two to five years, which allows you the opportunity to get the financing to pay the rest off. And by then you already have a sizable chunk that you've paid down in two to five years as well. What are you seeing for prices? You mentioned people a lot of times pay cash. So I'm wondering if these people just have a lot of cash that they can put in these properties, or maybe they're cheaper there than they are here in the U S and I mean, I'm sure it, it varies, right. Depending on which country you're in, but just generally speaking, are they cheaper uh, internationally than they are here in the U S? Yeah, I would say they're, they're cheaper to a degree. <laughs> they're cheaper in the sense that if we're looking at, let's just take Tulum, for instance, Tulum is growing like crazy outside of Cancun. Last year, you could have bought a property for like $40,000 and it would be new construction. And it may be there. You're starting to see more micro units where they're smaller, but that's the point. They're meant to just run out, stay for a few days, maybe two weeks. Um, so you can, I mean, now those properties are probably 70,000, but still that's not a crazy amount of money. And developers are also financing. So you may be able to go through developer financing if it's something brand new. So there's a lot of options, but I would say your medium price point might be around 300 something thousand. Um, of course, once you start talking about villas and larger places and oceanfront, it can run the gamut. But like if you're in the Northern part of Dominican Republic, which really isn't as popular, they're just getting their cruise port. That one, you get an oceanfront condo, two bedroom, two bath, beautiful high ceilings for $285,000. You could never get that oceanfront in Jamaica or Turks and Caicos. Those are going to be million dollar properties in those countries. It might be different for every country, but generally speaking, how do taxes and insurance work for international properties? How is it similar to the US and how is it different? So a lot of times... I would say it's similar in the fact that you have taxes and insurance, <laughs> but other than that, it's not similar. Um, the tax bases, especially if you're a foreigner, a lot of times it's actually a little bit less. And if you're going with the development, a lot of times those developers have negotiated like 10 to 15 year tax abatements where you won't have any taxes at all. So a lot of times it really works to go new construction. Uh, when you're looking at foreign property because of the fact that you'll get a tax break. And insurance-wise, it really depends on where you're at because we all know we're seeing the effects with what's going on with the hurricane. So it really depends on how many storms have hit that place. What does the weather look like? Um, but the insurance, you're probably looking at almost double than what you're, you are here. So a lot of times for resale homes here, it's around $1,000 a year, depending on your contents you'll probably be looking at 2000 abroad. What are some of the biggest challenges or drawbacks you've seen when dealing with international real estate? Oh, I think some of the biggest drawbacks are just, well, first, I think one of the biggest things is making sure that you have your expectations set. What do you want to do with this property? Um, are you looking for a cash cow? <laughs> are you looking for something that's luxurious that you can also rent out? and have your friends come down? Like, what is your purpose for that property? And I think one of the drawbacks is definitely the financing is you will have a higher interest rate. So as people see twos and threes, when they're getting their primary home, that's not the case with international, you're going to see a five and a six. And that's just because of the risk. Um, but those were actually the interest rates in the US in like 2005. So it's not that bad. 
But I, I think those are the biggest drawbacks. And then just understanding that a lot of the contracts that you sign will be in the language of the country. So make sure you have a translator, make sure you have a solid attorney where you're looking who can properly walk you through everything so that you understand and you're not getting any surprises. And one of the wonderful things is the fact that the tile insurance companies that are here in the US, a lot of them are in Mexico and abroad. So Stewart Titles, Chicago, like you can actually get title insurance from companies that are here that would give title insurance for your own home. One of the oldest adages in real estate is location, location, location. And I know firsthand from helping people learn how to buy rental properties long distance, even within the US, that becoming comfortable with the property's location is often a challenge for people. How can a buyer become comfortable with the specific location of their international property? How do they know it's a good and safe area? Is it simply from the fly and buy program? But what if, you know, what if they don't go on that type of, of retreat? Yeah, I would say really fly down and then talk to, just talk to people there, talk to expats there. There's always an expat community wherever you go. And they will be very upfront to say, oh no, <laughs> not there. Or have you looked here instead? I, I like this area better. And the reality is too, you're not always looking for expats, but you want someone who also understands your American experience that you have. So someone who is an expat, they're from the US, they've been living there, can definitely make you feel a lot more comfortable. But I would always say still fly there, take a look and make sure whatever deposit you put down that you know the timeline to get it back. When it comes to being a broker and an agent, what do you spend your time on? Do you do more international stuff? Are you more US-based? Is the international really just a small piece of what you're doing? Break that down for us. So international abroad with my clients is a smaller piece. It's definitely for me domestic. However, my business here, I have a lot of international clients. So I've helped sell real estate to clients from over 25 countries. Um, and that actually helped to, I would say, really help me look at international real estate as an option. Cause I would always ask questions about their countries, where they're coming from. You know, we have a different, I would say perspective of real estate. You know, when you look at Poland or somewhere in Eastern European, that is the family home. Like it's not getting sold in two years. You're not flipping it. Um, so we just have a different perspective of real estate and my, my business is definitely more focused here. And, but I do know probably in the next two years, I'll be back and forth probably six months out of, out of the year between countries. So, and so you help people buy from that. the U.S. <laughs> to other countries a lot. But what you just said is you also have a lot of people from outside the U.S. and you help them buy in the U.S. Yes. Are those Australia, mostly investors? Mostly investors. Um, I would say Australia, Canada, Israel, um, the Caribbean. I think I said Italy, like all over. And they are looking to buy for investment. And then I also have clients who work for the State Department who they have an assignment. It's probably going to be five years, but they also know that homes are going to steadily appreciate in the US. So they want to buy something at home, even though they're abroad. So it's a really big mix. In the show, we have a segment called the action plan. And part of the action plan is to answer three questions relatively quickly that give listeners something to implement in their life when they're done listening to this episode. So the first thing is what is a habit or principle that you follow in your life that not enough people do, but someone listening to the show should? I would hope everyone does, but I read every single morning. I read every single morning. Like it's, it's, it's a habit. And I feel like when you ingest something good, it helps to lead your day. How much are you reading every day? Um, I read a book for probably about 15 minutes in the morning. And then I listen, depending on where I'm going for about an hour. What has been the most influential book in your life? And it doesn't necessarily have to be your favorite because I think those two things could be different. But what has been the most impactful on you? The most impactful has definitely been deep work. Um, by Cal Newport? Book, yes. Um, I'm a rare type of person. So <laughs> I kind of, you know, I'm all over the place. 
And deep work just helped me realize you need to be still and, um, and, and think about your processes. And it's just, I'm rereading it again, because I know I didn't catch all the jewels the first time. I'm actually reading a book very similar. I actually haven't read this one yet. I, I might have listened to the audio book. I've definitely listened to at least one of Cal's other books. Might have been this one or, or a different one. But anyway, I'm, I'm listening or rereading a book called Indistractable by Nir Ayel. Kind of similar idea to doing uh, deep work, but it basically helps you deal with your distractions and how to um, fix them, basically. So that's another good one that you might want to check out. If you really like deep work from Cal, you'll, you'll really like this one as well. Adding that to the list, seriously, because I'm distraction attraction. <laughs> it's a good one for sure. And so when the listener is done with this episode, what is one action they should take after listening that can help them improve their life, career, or business? You know, I really think the biggest thing, and this book actually helped me just clarify that, is just stillness. Like, just sit still for 20 minutes and just see what comes to your mind. Because when you gain clarity, I think we've all gained a tremendous amount of clarity with COVID of what's important. What do we want to do? And we've taken more of a path towards life design. But I think we need to be entirely more intentional about that life design. Stop complaining and just sit down for 20 minutes and just let everything just dump out that comes into your brain. Just keep writing it. And then think about what that next action is. What was that glaring thing that you saw? And what are you going to take that? What's going to be that action point to get you to wherever your thoughts of life design are taking you? Is it a new job? Is it reading a new book and something else you want to learn? What is going to be that next step and do it, put it on your calendar. If it's not on your calendar, it doesn't exist. I say that all the time. If something is not on my (laughs) calendar, I will not do it. And so if somebody ever asked me for a meeting phone call, whatever. I said, sure, but send me a calendar invite because if I, if you don't, I, I won't be there. And it's just the way I work. Yeah. And if anybody's ever seen the movie, big fat liar, where the guy turns blue from jumping in the pool, he, oh, yeah. he has a little like device and he, he lives by that. And when he loses it, he literally is lost. And that's literally, that's basically me is if I don't have my phone or my calendar, I, I'm completely lost. I like to wrap up the show by turning the tables and I let the guest ask me a question. So Christian, what, what question do you have for me? So my question is, we've, of course, been in this COVID environment for now. I don't even know how long it is. Are we 18 months? I don't know. What's the biggest lesson that you've taken away? I think the biggest thing that I've learned is probably the importance of having multiple streams of income. And I have to admit, and, and I don't mean this from a place of, I can't even think of the right word, but basically I understand that some people have had a very hard time during COVID. For me, you know, and I have a lot of empathy for those people, but for me, my life hasn't changed a ton, uh, to be completely honest. And so I've been okay uh, throughout the, the pandemic, both health and financially, but I, I know that there's a lot of people out there that have struggled. And so I think that it's been really clear to me is that you need multiple streams of income to overcome these types of things. And I think one of the reasons why I have been in a decent spot is because I do have multiple streams of income. And so I think that's probably been the the most clear thing is whether you've been impacted by it or not. I think just realizing that things like this can happen. Maybe it's not a pandemic. Maybe it's something else that happens. Maybe that's a business cycle that ends and we just enter into a recession, whatever the case is having different streams of income can be helpful to get through these types of situations. So I'd I'd say that that's probably uh, the biggest thing for me. And also with so many people at home, that book you mentioned, Deep Work, you know, really focusing and what I mentioned, indistractable, being able to really manage your time is really important because you're at home. I mean, if you thought you had a lot of distractions in the office, I have way more distractions at home and I'm home by myself, like 24, (laughs) almost 24 seven. And I have more distractions at home. (laughs) <laughs> so I've learned that too. I think the, the passive income streams and then also really just time management, deep work, being indistractable, those types of things uh, have been the biggest things that I've learned. I love that. And I, I definitely feel like multiple streams of income. I learned that during the recession back in uh, the, the great seven, recession. Eight. So yep. yeah, so I um, definitely feel that. And I've been completely blessed through this whole time. So I understand where you're coming from, but it, it reiterated that for sure. <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So where Christian can people listening to the show go to find you? Where's the best place to connect with you? So I'm on all social platforms at Christian sold it. And my website is Christian sold it.com. And you can go and take a look at the flying by. And if you have time, join us in October and just, you know, rock out and look at some real estate and have fun. Like no pressure. Do you know, is that tax deductible for the people that are joining? Ooh, I believe I need to it find is. That out. I you feel know, like I'm not, it is. It's a business expense. Yep. So I, I'm not a I'm not a tax attorney. I'm not a CPA. So anybody listening, don't take this to heart. You know, talk to a, a tax Did professional. I, but I just read a, a tax book recently, and it said as long as you're um, planning the real the real estate or business activities ahead of time for the trip, which this sounds like it's all planned ahead, it's all tax deductible for your business. And so something to keep in mind. Perfect. Thank you. I'm going to check and I'll be sure to put that on my website as well. As soon as I confirm. Anybody that's interested in connecting with Christian, I will put her links in the show notes below. Christian, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.